drops of rain fell from the sky like the tears of a father who lost his son. Daniel Reed shifted his umbrella and sighted with his back to the church doors. You still have not lost that habit, my son? Father Michael said, announcing his arrival. I'm not your son. But you are. Nonetheless, I have something for you. He smiled amicably and reached under his jacket and retrieved a pouch where coins clinked together. This is from DuPont. As a reward from your last job. The detective took the pouch in his hands and looked into the contents. It was a number of gold coins. Gold? In our society, gold, silver, and blood are the only currency. There is, of course, the occasional favor. If you need to buy goods and services, that is the way. No one accepts cash, except for the very young among us such as yourself. Daniel Reed put the pouch inside his trench coat and turned to leave, but Father Michael called for his attention. You know, to be rewarded in this manner means he has you in high esteem. It is smart to keep the goodwill of a member of the Council. It could save your eternity one day. What do you want, Michael? Don't play games with me. Be direct or leave me alone. What I mean is that another member of the Council, Adrian Van Arden from the House Ashkari, is in need of help. Two members of the Tower, Ivan, the Preacher, and Antoinette, the Velvet Shade, destroyed his youngest son, Hendrik Blomkamp, a couple of nights before. Hendrik just brought someone into the blood, right? What was his name? Julio? Precisely. He disappeared after the attack. Usually in the Council, DuPont and Caroline Graves vote together. On the other hand, Spectre and Holloway vote together, leaving the Rancher and Van Arden with the casting votes. If we could have Van Arden on our side, it would strengthen our position against Bloody Mary and Yelena. So you want me to find Julio and bring him back? Splendid. Father Michael told him to look for the council member at the Dreadford Public Library, and as Daniel Reed approached its door, his acute senses heard. Don't worry, old man. If you don't want the help from the Shire Reaver, it is your prerogative. But if the shit hits the fan, don't come knocking. Bartholomew, you know I respect you, but as soon as I involve you in this, I'll have to open the doors of our library to court officials. And you know I cannot let this happen. So you are going to use DuPont's lackey? I don't have another choice. You and me go way back, Adrian. Remember who helped you and your children when everybody in this wretched city was suspicious of your house. The house of the betrayer. Don't speak of it, Bartholomew. You and I have been acquaintances for a long time, and I do not forget a favor, as you well know. The door opened, and a young man wearing black jeans, black shirt under a leather jacket and sunglasses stepped out followed by an old man with long silver hair wearing a red robe and walking with a cane. Look who we got here. Daniel Reed, private detective. I have all my eyes on you, puppet. The young man said as he left. Don't mind him. Van Arden reassured Daniel Reed. Please come in. They went in and Van Arden closed the door. So, Mr. Van Arden, how can I help you? Well, Mr. Reed, I must assume you already heard about the destruction of my youngest child, Hendrik. Yes, sir, I've heard about it. What you certainly don't know is that the new leadership of the Tower has a personal grudge against my house. It's been some time now that they have been sabotaging our attempts to promote a more secure environment for our family. Hendrik and his child, Julio, were the ones working on this project. Now that Hendrik is gone, this responsibility will befall on Julio alone, but he has disappeared. And that is where you come in. What makes you think he is not gone as well? We are a family of magicians, Mr. Reed. Be assured we have our own ways to know. Well, if you think it is kidnapping, did you receive a ransom note? No, that is my fear. They do not intend to exchange him, but to extract what he knows from his mind and then discard him. You want to protect your secrets? Mr. Reed, make no mistake. My family is the most dear thing to me in all my eternity. I would not think twice to set this whole city ablaze to save even one of them, especially my only grandchild from my recently destroyed son. Van Arden had an intense look on his eyes as he spoke, and it did not need anything else to convince Daniel, who had seen with his own eyes the old gentleman setting another vampire on fire, but with a gesture at his introduction. Okay, sir, take me to his quarters then. One thing, Mr. Reed, before we start. 
The reason I am trusting you, and therefore DuPont, is because this house holds many secrets. If I had accepted the help from the Shire Reaver, I would have to invite Nosferatu from all houses here. And that is something I cannot afford for the sake of my children. I understand, sir. You can trust me. That is the thing, Mr. Reed. I need some reassurance on that trust. For that, I'll need you to sign a non-disclosure agreement, as it is the business parlance. Van Arden pulled a parchment from his robe, and Daniel got a pen. No, Mr. Reed. I'll need you to sign it in blood. After signing the contract, Van Arden took Daniel to Julio's quarters. The detective sifted through the belongings. He saw engineering books, notebooks, notes, drawings, and lots of calculations. Whatever the Van Ardens were building was big. Then he found blueprints for an oil rig offshore, and finally he found a photo of Christina. Now he knew he was looking for an obsessed and analytical married man. He asked about the woman to Van Arden who promptly revealed she was hospitalized in Dreadford's General Hospital, where Hendrick was destroyed and Julio was seen last with a family car and a familiar for security. That was the next logical place to investigate, so he bid the magician farewell and departed to the hospital in his car. On the way, Daniel kept thinking about the way Van Arden talked about his children. He sounded like a real father to them, even for Julio, calling him a grandchild. Of course, he was not crying, as you would expect from a normal person. After all, he was a vampire, but he clearly sounded in mourning, as if his children were in fact really dear to him. That made him think about Father Michael. Did the priest really think about him, as Van Arden thought about his children, or was it manipulation? He felt conflicted about his sire, but then he remembered his speech about promising eternal life and forbidden pleasures to his victims. Even if Father Michael was like a father to him, he still was a murderous monster. He still was the Midnight Fiend. Most people have fathers, but not all fathers were like Van Arden. He parked the car inside Dredford's General Hospital's garage. The place was cold and humid. A flickering light badly illuminated the space and drops of water echoed from the pipes that crossed the ceiling. He walked around searching for clues and his eyesight was not bothered by the darkness. After a while he finally found some shell casings and grains on the floor that he quickly realized were ashes. He touched it and felt it between his fingers. Suddenly he felt removed from time itself. His senses were transported to the past and he saw the battle that unfolded with his own eyes. He saw Hendrik saving Julio and putting him inside the car. He saw Ivan turning him into ashes at the same time. The car made its escape from the garage as if he was there. Still transported into the past, Daniel Reed tried to follow the car that escaped with Julio but couldn't. His senses flickered between past and present, making it impossible. He looked around and noticed drops of blood on the floor, and he did the same as he did with the ashes. His senses were transported again, but the appearance of the place slightly changed as if he was looking now through the lenses of a different person, and now he could follow the car long enough to see its plates. The detective collected some samples of blood and ash from the ground and went outside. Since he was in a hospital at night, there was a chance he could find a police cruiser outside. The hunch panned out and he approached the vehicle as he exuded his supernatural charm on the cop. The man greeted him and was more than happy to check the plates for a fellow investigator. The plates were in the name of a company called Van Arden Gas and Oil, which did not surprise the detective. He then asked if he could help him find said vehicle, which again, the police officer was more than happy to oblige. After a couple of hours, the cop received the location of the vehicle through the radio. It was on the northeast of the city near the train tracks, which was recognized as territory of the tower, as it was explained by Father Michael. Daniel asked kindly for the vehicle to be left alone and that no further investigation should take place. The cop was more than happy to comply and even gave Daniel his card in case he needed any help before the detective departed. Daniel arrived at his destination, parked and started to investigate the car almost immediately, but suddenly the hunger assailed him. Since he got into the garage of the hospital, he felt that each time he used his supernatural powers, the thirst grew more, and now it was starting to feel unbearable. He looked around and the neighborhood was completely abandoned, no one around. He thought about looking for stray dogs or rats, but remembered they could transmit diseases and that got him frustrated. Anger started to bubble inside him, and he felt as if something ancient and evil was trying to crawl out of his body. He heard a prolonged high-pitched scream of an eagle that came from deep inside his soul, making him instinctively close his eyes and cover his ears. 
He felt suffocated by the hunger, and when he opened his eyes they were luminous, blood red, and he was growling. He closed them again, trying to regain control over himself with all the will he could muster, and when he opened the eyes a second time they were normal again and the growling slowly faded. He needed to feed or else he could commit something terrible. He sifted through his wallet and found a business card. He got his cell phone and dialed the number, and a young woman answered. Well, well, well. Hello, little cousin. Mary, I, I need help. I, I need... I am thirsty. Really thirsty. Hmm, okay, cousin. But it's gonna cost you. I, I can pay you in gold. It's gonna cost you extra for an express delivery. I, I don't... I don't care. Send it. Send it fast. Okay, tell me where you are. Twenty minutes went by that seemed like years, but a man with a backpack in a motorcycle arrived. Daniel paid him with two gold coins and got three pints of blood from the man who left promptly. Daniel went through the blood like a rabid animal, but he had to agree with Dupont. This was not as good as what he drank in the church. Now the thirst was held at bay, but somewhere in his soul he could still feel a low growl. Now he could give the necessary attention to the matter at hand. He cleaned his mouth and walked to the car of his mark. Daniel was still light-headed, but started to investigate the car. He noticed some dry blood on the bottom of the back door, and there were some signs of struggle near the car. He found some shell casings that matched the previous ones he found in the hospital garage. He deduced that the struggle was between Julio and the familiar, but why? He discerned marks on the terrain that seemed like footprints and followed it. It seems that one of them was running from the other. Was the familiar working for the tower as well? He was tempted into displacing his senses into the past, but was afraid that it would make him hungry again. He decided to do this the old-fashioned way with good detective work. He followed the footprints and on the way found more shell casings, but now he was walking on concrete in an alley and lost the trail. He kicked a can and sighted. That's when it hit him. The smell of blood. It was not fresh, maybe from a day ago. He did not know how he could possibly know that, but he did. It was faint, but he knew he could follow. The smell took him into an abandoned building across a junkyard. It was easy to get in, and the place was in absolute darkness. The smell of blood was very strong now. He went up to the next floor, and in a room with no windows there it was. The corpse of the familiar. Daniel approached it to analyze it when suddenly a flash of fire almost burnt him into a crisp. He moved a few steps away from the corpse and saw Julio supported by his cane, with fire on his other hand. So you found me, scum! He hurled another volley of magical fire in Daniel's direction, who barely dodged. What are you talking about? You know it! Julio dropped his cane on the floor and recited an incantation. His other hand was covered in flames, his eyes went blood red, and the corners of the room were set ablaze. I swear I will burn this place down with you if you don't take me to her! The room was quickly getting covered in flames, fiery debris was falling from the ceiling, and Daniel started to feel a fear he never felt before. He felt that monster rattling the cage in his soul for the second time this night, but now it was a lot harder to keep it caged. Stop it! I don't know what you're talking about! Not until you will take me to where she is! Daniel closed his eyes and when he opened again it was red like Julio's. He growled and took his stake from underneath his jacket. Julio noticed and with his flaming hands pointed at the ceiling directly over Daniel, making it explode and fall over him. For the first time, the blood inside Daniel burned like gasoline and he saw everything in slow motion. He saw the ceiling falling down and on instinct got out of the way. He moved like Father Michael did when they first fought. He looked at Julio and saw the surprise slowly rising in his face. The detective pointed the stake, and in less than a second crossed the whole room, piercing Julio in the heart as they broke through the wall of the corridor behind him. Julio did not turn to ashes as Daniel expected, but he was immobilized with his eyes open still, with a surprised expression. The magical fire in the other room was extinguished, except for the places where it spread. Daniel put them out and turned to Julio. Somewhat instinctively, he knew Julio could hear him and was conscious. Listen. I am Daniel Reed. I am a private detective hired by your grandsire, Adrian Van Arden, to find you and take you safely to the library. I am not here to hurt you, but to help you. I'm going to take this out of you if you promise me not to set me on fire." Daniel stood there and realized the vampire could not answer him. He sighted and turned around, looking at the burned place. Suddenly he heard inside his mind, 
Agreed. Daniel turned, smiling back to the vampire. Amazed, he proceeded to remove the stake from his heart. Julio gasped for air instinctively and slowly got on his feet. Daniel extended a hand. The magician looked in distrust for a moment, but accepted. So, Daniel, I am sorry for my behavior. I thought you were one of the members of the tower. Yeah, and I figured. Now come, you are safe now. I'll take you to Van Arden. No, I can't. Not yet. What do you mean? The familiar who betrayed your family is dead. We can leave. He did not betray my family. I betrayed him. Julio turned his back, fighting his shame. When we left the hospital, he wanted to take me back home. But I convinced him we should stay. My wife was in the hospital when we needed to get her out before coming back. We saw the Russian man and the woman living with her, so we followed them into the junkyard across the street. We meant to storm it and rescue her, but the hunger... The more I used my magic to help us, the stronger it got. We were planning the assault in the car when it struck me. Being a good familiar, he offered himself. As I began to drink from him, I felt a monster inside my soul like an animal that could not be sated. They were silent for a moment. I fought it, told him to run. He did, but I could not keep the Nephilim at bay anymore. The owl inside me wanted his life. He ran, we fought, but well, you know the rest. Daniel looked away. He remembered Father Michael telling him that one day he might end a life like the priest did to Sarah. The horror grabbed him by surprise when he realized all of them. Father Michael, Dupont, Bloody Mary, Van Arden and his children, even himself were all monsters behind this very thin veneer of humanity they displayed when playing the theater. They were monsters. They were Nosferatu. Don't worry. It happens to all of us sooner or later. He put his hands on the magician's shoulder trying to comfort him. For some reason, he forgave Julio for his indiscretion. Did that mean he should forgive Father Michael? Or did it mean he was losing himself to the monster beneath? Now let's save that wife of yours. Julio shared with him the intel he had on the junkyard. His wife was in a little shed, guarded by five familiars. One Nosferatu came once to check on them early at night and left, and was not the Russian man, nor the brunette woman. Someone who felt less powerful. So we should wait for him to come and get in sometime after he leaves. Perfect. The Nosferatu came right before you got here. We should move. Daniel agreed, and the vampires went out to stalk the night. They moved across the street and faced the chain-link fence. Daniel burned his blood and ripped through the fence with brute force so he and Julio could go through. They stalked through the shadows and noticed one of the familiars keeping watch of the terrain. Moving in silence, Daniel passed by the familiar unnoticed through the right. Julio went through the left but stepped on an empty can calling the familiar's attention, who caught him with a flashlight. But before he could make a sound, Daniel bit his neck and the only sound was the familiar gargling and drowning in his own blood. Julio winced for a moment with the gore visual, but kept his head straight on the mission. When they got near the shed, they noticed three men on the entrance talking amongst themselves. Daniel got a rock from the ground and threw a couple of yards away making a noise. Two of the men got up to check the sound. Julio made his way to the remaining member and hit him in the head with a rock, and he immediately fell unconscious. The other two split to cover more ground, allowing Daniel to dispose of them discreetly with the butt of his gun. He came back and met Julio. They looked at the door and got in. A man held a gun to Christina's head, and both knew that he was not a familiar, but a vampire. So the court sent you two to retrieve her. That's not going to happen, he said with a smile. Leave her with us and we will let you walk out of here in one piece. I'll have the hostage here, court scum. I call the shots. I can't believe you would risk an eternity for this blood sack. That's my wife! A blood sack for a wife? That's rich court hypocrisy at its best. What do you mean? I mean I can smell Nosferatu blood in her mouth. She's on the juice. Daniel looked disappointed at Julio. No, impossible. I never did this. Mr. Bronkham told me he would give her medicine. She has cancer. Christina cried in silence 
visibly terrorized and the vampire from the tower started to laugh. A tear of blood struck Julio's face. I did not know. Christina, I did not know. You are disgusting. Julio screamed in agony, pain and rage. His eyes were luminous and blood red as he set the clothes of his enemy on fire. Christina screamed <coughs> bloody murder in fear. The vampire holding her hostage shot the gun to her head almost at point blank, and Daniel saw all of this in slow motion. He ran as fast as he could like an eagle diving for the kill just in time to push Christina away, and so he would take the bullet for her instead. The vampire caught fire and turned to ashes. Christina fainted and Julio went for her. We have to get her out of here! Daniel agreed and they left. On the way back inside Daniel's car they were silent. Julio caressed Christina's face, bloody tears streaking his own. Daniel was silent. He thought about biting the neck of the man in the junkyard about the familiar Julio had killed by mistake, about Christina surviving cancer on vampiric blood. What kind of fresh new hell was he living? Was all of this worth it to avoid death? Maybe not. Maybe Sarah O'Connor was the lucky one.